All right. Well, uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to uh, Auto Instrumenting, Go Libraries for Tracing with eBPF and OpenTelemetry. Uh, my name is Mike Dame. I'm a software engineer at Google. Hi. I'm. Uh, can, can you all hear me by chance? Oh, yeah, just like in the back? Okay, cool. I'm going to hopefully crane a little bit. But um, I'm Tyler Yan. I, I work at Splunk as a software engineer as well. Uh, I've been in the OpenTelemetry space for about four years now, um, and we both work pretty actively in the automation station project for OpenTelemetry and Go, uh, specifically. So, yeah. Uh, so this is a long title for uh, or a talk, so uh, there's a lot of things to talk about. Um, before we get into what our solution actually does and what it is, I'm going to briefly touch on some of those other topics that are in this long title, um, tracing and OpenTelemetry, um, just kind of the fundamentals of the problems that we're trying to solve in those spaces. Um, those are really broad topics that are literally their own conferences themselves. So um, there's going to be a lot uh, left to talk about, and there are some other talks about these topics, too, that I would definitely recommend checking out this week. Um, so yeah, the first topic um, here is tracing. Uh, so what is tracing? If you're not familiar with it, tracing is um, the idea of linking together um, requests from services to see the full end-to-end the full -end -end, um, uh, a task that happens. Uh, so um, say, for example, you have a microservice cloud app with a bunch of different services talking to each other. Um, tracing, distributed tracing, links all of these requests together so you know the checkout request happens before the payment request. Um, and that uh, the idea of th that idea is called a trace. And um, a single trace has a bunch of child spans under it where each of these requests, um, each of these services are creating a span. And they're attaching context contextual information about the work that they did to that span. Um, what's really critical to the spans, besides the contextual information, is uh, the ordering. And that ordering is preserved uh, through uh, an idea called context propagation. Um, that is when the uh, incoming request uh, sends some contextual information about where it came from. The processing service then adds its own context on top of that and passes that on to the outgoing request or the response that I came from. Um, this can be done with uh, standard W3C uh, trace context headers, or there's also proprietary formats that, like Google Cloud has their own. Um, that's actually deprecated now, but uh, everything's kind of trending towards this standard along with open telemetry, which is, we'll, we'll talk about where that comes in on the next slide. Um, but this, these standards let uh, SDKs and libraries like open telemetry implement this context propagation really easily or even automatically. OK, cool. So what is OpenTelemetry? Uh, OpenTelemetry is an open source, vendor agnostic project that provides APIs, SDKs, and other tooling to allow you to add observability to your application. Um, it used to be the case that you needed to take a dependency on a vendor's instrumentation library or their agent to add observability to your application. This dependency locked you into that relationship. If you ever wanted to switch to, say, an open source platform or another vendor, it required a big uh, lift in your changing out your code. Um, open telemetry provides, uh, open, open telemetry prevents this. It allows you to instrument your application once using its APIs uh, and instrumenting things that you're actually interested in. Um, and then from there, you're able to uh, integrate with all the open source platforms. You're able to integrate with the uh, rich ecosystem of open telemetry vendors, um, all without ever having to change your code after you've done that initial integration. Uh, this compatibility, it comes from the tooling and the SDK power that back these APIs. Uh, these allow for the custom processing, the annotation, and the exporting of data to all these variety of different sources with fine-tuned control. So this interoperability and uh, this prevention of vendor lock-in are two of the big parts of open telemetry, uh, but they're by no means the only uh, important parts of open telemetry. Uh, for instance, one of the big things is if you're generating a lot of data, it's kind of useless unless you, unless you can identify what that data actually contains, right? And OpenTelemetry uh, helps you in this by providing what things called semantic conventions. Yeah, so semantic conventions are another big part of OpenTelemetry besides the APIs and the SDKs and all the tooling um, that really guarantee that the data that you're sending is going to be interpretable universally. Um, and I promise all of this is going to tie back into what we're doing, but... Uh, if you're not familiar with semantic conventions, I have an example of what these actually look like in JSON representation with your uh, telemetry. Um, they are just attributes that get added onto, onto the telemetry data. So in this case, we have an HTTP request, then we're looking at 
the method um, and the route for that request. And so because that's universally interpretable, um, you see, for example, here in a, a Jaeger UI, that can show up as an attribute. You can filter. Uh, you know what that means. Um, so the naming for these attributes, the definitions, um, for example, what does a host attribute mean when you're sending data from a VM versus a Kubernetes node? Um, what does the instance ID mean on Cloud Run versus Knative? Um, is it the pod UID? You know, things like that are all community defined as a standard, um, and that is uh, you know, implementing that in your code is really key to leveraging OpenTelemetry as a standard beyond just the API and the data format and to making data interpretable. Yeah, cool. Okay, so that's a lot of really high level concepts. But what does this actually look like in practice? How do you actually implement OpenTelemetry? So to walk through again a little bit more detail here, uh, what you want to do if you want to actually integrate with OpenTelemetry is to use their APIs to actually make that instrumentation possible. So in many programs, uh, public programming languages, they provide packages, and we'll talk specifically about Go today. Uh, so in Go, you're going to import these API packages directly. Uh, using these API packages, you're going to create spans uh, from a tracer to encapsulate the code functionality that you find uh, that you need observability into and that you have interest in. Uh, this is where the semantic conventions are really important for you to understand at this point, and you have to have that familiarity, because in those spans you need to make sure that you're properly annotating them, you're properly creating them to comply with these standards. So additionally, or alternatively, uh, instead of you manually using these uh, APIs, you can import common libraries that provide this instrumentation for you. These are third-party libraries, sometimes managed by OpenTelemetry uh, uh, itself. Uh, you know, you're looking at a few maintainers here. Um, and so these are really well-designed uh, instrumentation libraries that provide common functionality of these packages that you're trying to instrument. Things like doing HTTP requests, things like database execution queries, or something like that. Like it gives you really quick, uh, just by importing them and setting it up, uh, you're automatically instrumenting them. They're really good for general use cases. However, fine-tuned details, uh, like adding specific attributes or details about function code that you're actually interested in, is not something that they provide commonly. So you're going to have to go back to those OpenTelemetry APIs. So that's a lot, but you're not done yet. Uh, you still need to send the data somewhere. These APIs by themselves are no ops. They don't actually do anything uh, with, unless they're backed by an SDK. So you need to also then go ahead and configure your application to set up an SDK, install that SDK, make sure it's correctly uh, processing and sending it off to the cor uh, correct location, right? So I'm seeing some eyes glaze over because that's starting to sound like a lot of work, right? Um, and you're not wrong, it is. Um, it, it could definitely be a, a handful, right? This is a fully customizable uh, approach. It gives you fine-tuned control over it, um, and it's supported wherever your language is supported, right? But it requires uh, kind of a high barrier entry. You have, to, you have to actually be able to change the code as well, uh, which can be prohibitive. Um, just you know, for as an example, we have pulled up a PR here. This is to add OpenTelemetry to uh, an application that's a really simple one. This is just an HTTP server that handles a single route. There's over 200 lines of code just to set this up. Uh, and SDK is most of that configuration, the instrumentation as well, right? So is there a better solution? Like, we're here to talk about auto instrumentation today. Can that help us solve this problem? Okay, so to kind of talk about auto instrumentation and get us into that frame of mind, let's talk about just the generalized pattern of auto instrumentation. So many languages in OpenTelemetry automatically support this automatic instrumentation. This is accomplished by the flow that we see here. The source code is compiled into bytecode. That bytecode is run on a VM which interfaces with the operating system kernel. So the auto instrumentation agent sits along this bytecode to virtual machine pathway. It'll automatically update and inject the uh, bytecode with instrumentation for functions or libraries that you are actually interested in. Additionally, it will do the whole setup of that SDK for you, configuring the, uh, the endpoints uh, that it's actually going to send to. So this, again, it provides very good generic information for known libraries uh, without any code changes. You don't actually even need to understand the underlying uh, code that you're actually instrumenting. The automatic instrumentation is designed to do this. Um, so this is great. Can it work for things like Go that are statically compiled? So to better understand this, let's look at how Go programs are actually built. Um, this looks different, right? <laughs> uh, unfortunately, Go programs are compiled into binary executables, and those executables are run directly on the operating system within the kernel, right? There is no bytecode to VM pathway, so how are we gonna use auto instrumentation to solve this problem? Yeah, so like Tyler just said, there's nothing that we can dynamically hook into in the Go runtime to change libraries or change code. 
Um, Go just runs on the host. Um, but if we do go that one layer down into the host, there is uh, you know, a possibility where we can load dynamic code, and that's using eBPF. Um, so if you're not familiar with eBPF, uh, it's a system that's actually been around for quite a while and is gaining some traction now um, that lets you write these uh, sort of small programs that can be loaded into the kernel at runtime. Uh, the kernel doesn't need to be recompiled. This is, you know, they're hot swappable, they're secure. Um, they give access to you know, syscalls, um, events on the host. You can even look into user space, which is what we'll show in our demo. Um, so this kind of accessibility with eBPF makes it popular for things like networking, measuring service mesh, um, security, seeing all of the syscalls that are happening on your system, or observability, things like profiling, metrics, traces. Um, this is what eBPF starts to come into, maybe give us that view of a dynamic approach to Go. All right, so, um, you know, like I was saying, eBPF is already popular for observability. Um, these, uh, you know, these solutions offer a lot of things like host level events, the network requests that are happening. Uh, Tyler talked about how auto instrumentation is already really popular in open telemetry, um, but we're bringing both of these concepts together for Go in uh, what we think is like a really uh, novel way that we haven't seen done before. Um, the big difference between what we're doing and what is kind of out there in eBPF observability today is that we're also writing into the user space memory itself, uh, which obviously comes with some security implications that we'll talk about. Uh, there's questions about performance. Um, the agent that we have needs to know a lot about the application that it's looking at. Um, but when you can get that uh, you know, reading from the code and writing into the code, you really get a lot richer telemetry at the library level within the application that's been statically compiled, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so, why we're here. This is how it works. Uh, what we've built uh, is this Go auto instrumentation agent, which is open source project just like the rest of open telemetry. Um, it is a single agent that runs on your host uh, alongside your target binary, whatever your application is. So this could be as a, uh, a Kubernetes sidecar container in a pod. Um, and if you run the open telemetry operator, you can deploy auto instrumentation with Go that way today. Uh, that's how it does it. Uh, it does a webhook that injects this sidecar container. But we have this auto instrumentation agent. The eBPF programs that are part of it that will hook into the code, and Tyler will dig into that in a little bit more detail. Um, those are going to be compiled and bundled into the agent executable, so it's just one thing that you have to run. Uh, the agent does three things, basically. It has these three controllers in it. Uh, the first thing that it does is analyze your target binary. Uh, that's the analyzer. It will, uh, you, you start up the agent, you tell it which binary you want to instrument. It'll find that running process on the host. It'll break down that executable and look into things and find things like what version of Go it was built with. Um, what dependencies it imports so that it knows which eBPF programs it needs to load into the system. Uh, it passes all that information, those binary details, to the instrumentation manager, which is, as a controller, kind of the heart of the program, um, of the agent. It's going to load the specific eBPF programs into the kernel, which will do the work of hooking into your user's functions. Um, and then it's going to start an event loop to read the events that come out of eBPF. It's going to process those events and hand them off into the open telemetry controller, which does the work of setting up that OTEL SDK, formatting these into OTLP traces, and then exporting them to a collector or an OTLP endpoint that you have running uh, anywhere. So. OK, cool. So now we have an understanding of how the open telemetry auto instrumentation agent works. How does it actually integrate with the uh, eBPF uh, system itself? right? So uh, we know from what Mike just said that we have a target process that we want to actually look at, and we know that we have some eBPF program that needs to be loaded somewhere, right? So how does that actually get done? So to do this in our project, we leverage the Cilium project, which abstracts a, much of these details away from us. Uh, to be honest, like we work with high-level APIs, but underneath the surface to better understand what's actually going on. What we will do is we'll make a BPF syscall to load the pre-compiled programs that Mike was just talking about uh, from our user space into the kernel. Uh, this will be passed through a verifier and then a just-in-time compiler, which transmutes the bytecode into machine code itself, uh, loaded within the actual kernel space. 
On top of that, a U-probe is inserted into the target program with a breakpoint uh, to instrument target libraries that we're in interested in. Again, this is things like an HTTP server request or a database query at this point, right? Uh, and this is it. This is now we have a process that's instrumented. Uh, our EBF program's loaded, and we're just, just waiting. Uh, what we're waiting for is for that U-probe to actually be called. Uh, when the U-probe is actually called, what will happen is a uh, interrupt will be triggered the context will be switched back to our eBPF program. The eBPF program will look at the state of the system, including user memory or the uh, other operational behaviors, and gather the tracing information that's needed for the user to actually gain insights into the uh, instrumentation provided. Those uh, tracing information is then communicated back to the auto instrumentation agent using eBPF maps, and these are the things that Mike was just talking about where the event loop is looking for. This is how it's communicated back. Once the eBPF program is done, the context is switched back to the original program and normal processing uh, continues. So how does this look in our code itself as a good example? Yeah, and just to touch a little more on that, the, uh, that event loop is happening asynchronously from the business logic. We have the, I'll talk a little bit more in a couple slides about that, but that context switch happens, the information gets offloaded and then um, the agent works asynchronously. In our agent's code, uh, just to give an example here, I know it's pretty small, um, but this is the kind of um, probe that we're building. It's called a probe object that we have. Um, we do things like we uh, identify the object itself with the name of the package that we're instrumenting. We tell it which functions specifically we want to look at. So in this example, it's the, uh, the net slash HTTP client, which if you make any HTTP calls and go, you're probably very familiar with this. Uh, the function that we're inter interested in is round trip, um, which is a private function, basically any you know, call or higher level, higher level library that you use is going to end up calling this. So we look at the very lowest level functions to instrument. Um, and even though it's private, it doesn't matter because we have access to every symbol in the compiled binary. Uh, so we just break it down and we can find the memory address for where that happens. Um, the next things that we need to look at once we know the function are the fields that we want to get out of that. So this is just a snippet of some of the fields because the full thing is very long. Um, but First off, the first thing is going to be the request context. If you're familiar with Go, you know the context object in every request. That's where your headers are going to be. Um, that's where we're going to read the trace context that, could, that came from an incoming request, where we're going to write our outgoing, updated, new span that we're creating. Um, and then other things like the, uh, the method and the scheme, just to give two examples, um, there's you know, the URL, the port, the path, a whole bunch of different fields that we get out of this so that we can add those semantic convention attributes to the traces uh, so that you can get the full detailed picture. Just to be clear, when you're running the agent, you do not have to write any of this code. Uh, this is just to show what our code is doing and to give an example of like the library that we're building out of this. Um, because this gives us the ability to reuse this a lot to instrument other libraries. And even like what we would like to do someday is expose these libraries, uh, this API package that we have externally so that you can custom uh, write custom auto instrumentation for your libraries too. Maybe you're a popular library developer or you have a, you know, an internal library at your company that you just want to be able to deploy auto instrumentation um, and get traces out of your own private functions. Um, so this sort of object gets, is what gets passed to the instrumentation manager once the analyzer has broken down the object. Cool. Okay. Um, that's a lot, but let's actually see if we can understand how this is actually run in process, maybe understand the value of it a little bit better. Yeah, uh, I apologize, also. I'm gonna have to look over my shoulder to actually run this demo, so. Um, may get a little awkward here in just a second. Um, okay, so who here is an SRE? Maybe just start off that way. Maybe show of hands. Uh, cool, so nobody. Uh, so this is gonna be totally new to you, uh, no. Who here has actually debugged something in their in their lifetime? Okay, so this is actually going to sound way more familiar. You're than... all SREs now. Congratulations. <laughs> um, okay, perfect. So what we're going to do is we're going to play a little game. Um, we're going to actually start up something because uh, I forgot to run the demo before I actually came in here. Um, and so there we go. I think I'm on the right stream. Yeah. Again, sorry, looking over my shoulder. Um, 
cool. Now we should be all set. OK. Uh, so we're going to assume the role of an SRE. So this is going to be uh, a little bit new and unfamiliar. But uh, what this looks like is you just got a report from a user named Alice. Alice is reporting that she's using your application, and it's failing at random intervals, right? So as an SRE on, ta uh, on call, you're tasked with looking into this. Um, this is a pretty simple application. It's called Roll Dice. What it does is it returns a number between 1 and 6, uh, which is a roll of a dice. Um, and uh, it's comprised of these very two simple services, a user service and a front end service. Um, you're also pretty new to the team, so let's see if we can get some better information about this. So to start, let's see if we can reproduce the error that Alice is experiencing, which uh, should be, let's see. OK, so we can see the number updating in the top left. OK, we've got an internal error. Um, yeah, definitely keep running this. Yeah, a few different internal errors. OK. So we can reproduce the error. We know it's real, right? Like this is something that we can actually uh, track down. Luckily, we also know that the front end service has just updated their application with manual instrumentation for open telemetry. This is something that the team went through and they've just released this code base. So what we can do is we can jump into our Jaeger UI here. Uh, at, our, at our, wow, that's huge. <laughs> um, so in our Jaeger UI, we should be able to, if you're not familiar, this is a tracing interface. Essentially, it's a place that we can dig through a bunch of our traces. We can search for traces that are coming from the user service. Uh, and hopefully, uh, we are definitely seeing some traces coming from the user service. Uh, there's some red ones, which look interesting. That seems like it's going to be relevant. Um, so maybe we can jump down here and look at one of those uh, traces. This has three errors. OK. Um, all right, so let's take a look at this. What we have here is we have a trace to the front end service. Uh, it has a tag name error, which uh, seems relevant, uh, and apparently I can't see anything because this thing's huge. Um, but it's to the roll dice service, uh, and it's for the user Alice. So this looks ideal, right? Like uh, I'm, I'm telling you, like at this point, you're all going to be SREs uh, when you go back to work. Um, so you're qualified at this point. Um, and so digging into this, we know that this is the actual error that we're interested in. So this is going to let's see if we gain some insights into actually what's going on here. So what we can see just based on this trace, is going through the front end service, there is a span for the in, uh, ingress of this service. There is another span here that is uh, internally formatting. Uh, and then it also looks like there's this, the service itself is making a git request. And that git request, let's see if we can dive into the tags. I apologize. I didn't practice this with the screen being massively huge. But um, we're making it work, right? Uh, it looks like if we, if you can see, let me see if I can scroll a little bit further uh, higher up. It's making a request to the user service. That user service uh, is on this URL right here, right? And that is the one that's actually returning a 500. So great. Now we've isolated that, prob uh, that problem, and it's going to be in the user service. Unfortunately, there's no spans for the user service here, right? Like, we don't have any observability into the user service. Well, uh, being a resourceful SRE, as you all now are, uh, we know that the auto instrumentation for Go project can be used here, right? So what we can do is we can log into production, which is always a smart idea. Um, and we can download the auto instrumentation agent, and we can go ahead and build it. Uh, and so what we have is we have some sort of Go executable here. So we can start running this executable. Uh, uh, there we go. Uh, let me jump back here. We can run this Go executable. Uh, and it should be able to start auto-instrumenting this process. We won't have to actually touch the user service here. Uh, but what we want to do is we want to first, if we can, I'll try to highlight things. Um, we first want to tell it where to send the spans. This is that Jaeger instance we were just looking at. Second, we want to tell it what to actually instrument. And that's going to be that user binary that we know is running. Uh, and then the last thing that's up here is also going to be this uh, service name. We need to scope all of the telemetry that we're sending. So it identifies it as a different service. Like things like the front end are going to show up different than things like the user service. Um, and then I lied, because the last thing we're actually going to do is run it with sudo. That's something that Mike was just talking about. We need to run with elevated permissions to talk to, into the uh, um, user space itself. So let's see if I can remember my password. Uh, cool. OK, so now it looks like it's starting up. And there's a lot going on here. But if you are really paying attention, you can see this is kind of the, uh, the high-level overview of what Mike was just talking about. It's going through a process identification. It's finding the particular process in the PID that we were actually, it's actually running on. It's going through and it's in, uh, analyzing that target process. And it's saying like, hey, look, it has a bunch of these dependencies in this process. Do I know any of these? Uh, it's handing that off to the manager. The manager is saying, yeah, actually, I do know all of these. I'm going to start loading some probes. These probes are going to be for the net HTTP. They're also going to be for the database, which uh, is right there. Um, 
because it's the next line down. Uh, okay, so cool. So what does this actually look like then? If we go back to our UI here, and we search, um, retry to regenerate this error, and it looks like we're doing a good job. Looks like it's happening all over the place. We can go back to our Jaeger UI, and we can search for some more spans. Okay, let me see. Uh, what's that? Uh, maybe, hold on, I'm having a hard time seeing it. Uh, so we got three, so okay, let's, let's, uh, let's see if we can use uh, some filtering, use some semantic conventions here, right? Uh, we know that there's gonna be some sort of error tag associated with our span. So let's try uploading there. So okay, cool, there we go. That's somehow, I can see that a lot easier. Uh, so if we jump in here, and it's not the one that we're looking for. Uh, sorry. Live demos, right? Like it never actually works the way you're thinking about it. Uh, there we go. Let me see if I can reload. Uh, still three errors. Oh, okay. Let's try to regenerate some more of these errors. <laughs> okay. Definitely getting some more errors. Now if we go back. Ah, this looks like something I'm looking for. Perfect. Just on the wrong tab. I think I was just on the wrong tab. Uh, again, sorry, I'm doing this net craning thing. Okay, so cool. Now what we've got here is the user service. We've got spans from the user service. We didn't have to restart the binary. We didn't have to instrument the code. We didn't have to decompile this binary to understand what's going on here. But now I have library level instrumentation that is actually telling me that there is a particular uh, HTTP request. Within that HTTP request, there's a database uh, lookup within there, right? And that database lookup, if I look into that, I can see that there's probably, there's actually an error here. Uh, if I dig in, uh, it should be an error. <laughs> uh, and so if I dig into that, I can actually understand a lot more about the service, which is great. As an SRE, this is your job, right? So what we can do now is we can open up a ticket. We can say, hey, by the way, your user service, you're responding to a bunch of errors. Our, our user Alice is having problems, right? We need you to go figure this out. That's great, except you're really good at your job now. This is how you go the extra mile in the SRE role, right? You say like, hey, I actually know that the auto instrumentation service can integrate with the open telemetry APIs themselves. Let's see if we can add a little bit of observability into this process. So to do that, let's get out of production and we'll go and start up a, a user service locally. Uh, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna, auto, we're gonna look into the code base itself. So it seems like there's a server file here in that server file, we can definitely see that there's some sort of HTTP handler. The HTTP handler, here's the process, uh, and it's particularly looking at this handle alloc process. So if we jump down to that handle alloc function, what we can see in that handling of that request, we're parsing the request, we're opening a database connection. We're then also using that database connection to qu uh, query the database. And then from there, we're responding with some sort of JSON uh, in the response. Okay, so, uh, man, sorry, we're going, going really slow, apparently. Um, so let's see if we can add some spans here. To do that, we're gonna import the APIs that we talked about before. We're gonna create a tracer and we're gonna start a span. We're gonna end that span, but now we also wanna add some annotations so that we can get some insight into what the actual error is. To do that, we're gonna set the span status to error and pass the actual error message to the status. Um, so this should be good. Uh, this is actually pretty impressive because what we've done is we've added 10 lines of code and if we go and we rebuild this, uh, maybe. Uh, it should be able to be backed by the honor dissertation agent itself. So you got some open telemetry um, without having to do all of the 200 lines of code there because a lot of that has been offloaded already. Um, you can do just things like here I want a span instead of having to set up a tracer. Right, exactly. And so to back that, all we have to do is restart the honor dissertation agent. We have to pass in a new flag to tell it that we actually want to instrument this global. Uh, this should start up very similar to what we did before. It looks like it's loaded uh, a few more libraries. In particular, it's loaded the OpenTelemetry uh, probe, which is gonna be good because it's gonna back our API. So if we go back to the Jaeger, or sorry, to the application, we try to regenerate. Definitely getting some more errors. Uh, so now if we jump back into our Jaeger UI, do another search for traces. Uh, I'm not seeing them, but uh, maybe I'm on the wrong tab. Oh, maybe not. Okay, perfect. So now if we look at it, we actually see an extra span in the user trace, right? This user span is the span that we just created. Uh, this is pretty ideal, right? Like all we did is we just added an API and we backed it with the SDK. We didn't have to set up the SDK at all. 
we also now have a way clearer understanding because like we can understand this error. This is a database table is locked error, which if we do a, a quick uh, a quick review, we can find that there's a pretty well known issue that's associated with this. We can create an issue for the users uh, uh, user service and hand it back to them. So as this, we can use the auto interpretation project to really dive in and, and uh, add observability to the, to the service as well as help resolve user errors. So okay, with that we can jump back in. We are running late. I apologize for that. I know we are the thing keeping you from lunch. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll really quickly go through, um, you know, obviously a project like this has no issues whatsoever. So uh, besides a couple, um, really the, the core of this project is the ability to write that memory back in. And we do that with a BPF helper function called BPF probe write user. I have the description of that function from the man page here. And you can, it's small, but you can see that uh, it's not really meant for use in production. There are some security implications about um, a program being able to write into user memory. Um, so we're aware of that, and during this you know, beta development phase, we've been looking into some alternatives for how to do that, because being able to write the updated trace context back into the program is really paramount to getting context propagation. Otherwise, you're just getting context parsing, um, which doesn't really do that nice span change. I mentioned the security. The other thing is the performance um, overhead. And this is really more of just a trade-off that we need to keep balanced um, because any observability pipeline that you set up for your application is going to come with inherent overhead no matter what. Um, the goal is always to keep that minimal so that there's a negligible impact on the business logic, the money maker of your, uh, your application. Um, so like Tyler mentioned, there's context switches that happen in the, in the U probes in the function that go to the kernel. Um, when those happen, what we do is offload a lot of the, the pipeline, a lot of that 200 lines of code that was set up in the beginning um, to the asynchronous agent. So that information all gets written to an eBPF map and the context gets to go back into the program. Um, then you have that asynchronous agent running and in some early benchmarks we found that this approach when it's balanced properly uh, can be a lot faster than doing manual instrumentation within the, the hot path of your application itself. So. There's that context switch, but it comes with a huge trade-off, and this shows a lot of promise for really, really minimizing the overhead within um, your, your application so you can get good monitoring. Okay, cool. So hopefully we've inspired some sort of curiosity into this project. Hopefully you're going to go back and run it in production right away. Um, uh, but if not, uh, we also have a lot of things to work on too still. So our next big goals are stabilization. Uh, what that looks like is first we're looking to uh, make a beta release that is going to be a feature complete release that we're looking for a large amount of community evaluation to be done on. From that evaluation, uh, we definitely also want to have a lot of feedback on this BPF write mechanism that Mike's going to be talking about. It's one of those useful things. So if you have ideas as well, like please keep talking about it. Um, we also, in the beta release, uh, want to ensure that we make the, we're making a point to convention for that standard scope convention, as we've kind of shown that like they're important to scope and they're, they're really widely interpreted. Uh, so from there, we're going to try to make sure that any sort of community feedback is appropriately uh, integrated back to the application, make a GA release that can have backwards compatibility support and long-term support for that auto interpretation project. Uh, building off of that stability, we plan to look into adding more support from our libraries. So currently, we only support uh, MetHD, gRPC, Kafka Go, database control, and the open API, uh, open source API. APIs from Kafka Go. If you have a particular library from Kafka, uh, also there's other ways to communicate with us, but we'd love to hear some sort of like idea of what you want to support. And finally, uh, we've only talked about tracing code. Uh, observability has many other pillars, including uh, logs and metrics, so we plan to add some more support for that too. We're 
out of time, so if you are going off for lunch and you're really hungry, I totally get it. Um, go ahead, take off. But maybe we have time for just like one question. Uh, we almost uh, we have an hour, so you can take as many lines as you want. I'm gonna stop talking. Sorry. Um, if I was running it with sudo, that was a mistake. Uh, the user service doesn't actually need to be running it. Yeah. Uh, sorry, that must have been uh, an error. Uh, yeah, no, the, the only thing that it does need sudo is the auto installation agent, and that's kind of what Mike was talking about. It will write back to user memory, uh, and that's a, it needs elevated permissions to be able to do that. That's the only thing. Is the yeah. other capability? Yeah, I'm looking here. Context is the key here, right? Context is the thing that ties all of the spans back together, right? And so when you have an HTTP request, you need to make sure in those headers or gRPC requests in sort of metadata that you include that context within that request so services that can communicate, they know where they sit in that trace. So it's context, yeah. yeah so when you do like HTTP.new request, you pass that CTX object. These eBPF programs that are written in C and then compiled and bundled in, those are actually looking at that variable and rewriting the value of it so that when the func the, when the program continues, that's the new value that gets sent out. Okay, I see one more back there, yeah. No, yep, you. <laughs> so, can you uh, yeah, so the question is, uh, can we say more about repeat, repeat the question. BPF probe right yeah. user um, and what it's doing at a memory level? Um, that gives a little bit over my head. <laughs> Oh, I mean, uh, yeah, like there's a lot of details. It's, it's actually just literally like memory uh, byte copying at this point, right? But um, yeah, it, it, the, the issue is, is that memory that you're copying to, like if you're familiar with C, right? Like it, it is in a, in a bounded like memory space that is not accessible generally outside of like the kernel operating that it's actually running on. So that's all it's doing is it specifically says like, hey, by the way, like normally what you would do is copy to memory within your domain, right? Or within your range, right? We're gonna do something that's a little bit like risky here. Um, you know, it's essentially like grabbing a beer and calling YOLO. It's like, it's like we're gonna go back to the user space and write some memory, which like you need to. Like, this is actually one of those good use cases where that actually is, is helpful, right? But it, you know, as most people can understand, like that could be dangerous as well. So you wanna be very careful when you're doing these kinds of things. Oh, sorry, no, this again is back to the context propagation. So this is essentially into the HTTP header. Uh, we wanna know, hey, we know, have this header over here, we know the, the memory space that that is. I wanna update this header value, yeah. Yep. And because of those implications in more, in more recent versions of the kernel, this helper function has actually been um, put into a lockdown state where it can be locked down and not available. So um, you know, your host or your cloud provider might not make this available to you. We have. Um, some if else statements in there that will detect if it's available or not when you try to run this agent um, for security reasons. You can still run the agent and get traces out of it even if you're not writing the context propagation in. They just won't be linked together when it comes out of the agent. Um, but uh, more to come. We, we have some ideas there. And like if you have ideas, we'd love to hear them as well. But there's a lot of really cool, like very low level things we're trying to do to solve this. So yeah, really interesting stuff. Okay. Uh, I see some more questions, but I also want to be respectful of people's time, and I definitely know we're out of time. So why don't we end it here? If you have more questions, please come on up, uh, come talk with us, uh, and we're happy to answer more questions. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.